How is everybody? We're going to set up today, and we're going to talk about serving. People love serving. And love it. I th- you know, I think that people don't really pay enough attention to it. Uh, the little details are just going to be so important, like, you know, for serving harder, for serving better. Today, specifically, we're going to talk about how we can actually serve harder. Um, I know that it's preseason, so we're working, I'm working a lot on my serve and uh, the type of rhythm and power that I want to establish over time. And there's a few cues that really help me. And what I want to do is be able to help everybody else, um, give them those cues, and then keep on building this conversation of just higher level serving. I like it. We, uh, I actually posted something on my Instagram today about how you can have a more effective float serve. So just talking about contact and uh, kind of the same thing. Um, I think you and I kind of have some different styles of serving and different ideas. Um, I, I, I'm have kind of committed to a, a flat, fast, fast, flat float serve. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I've been playing around with that a little bit, and uh, I'm going to start adding a, a jump spin, top serve, top spin, jump serve. I don't know why I'm having a hard time saying that, but um, yeah, I, I think I think the conversation of serving, it's always tough because we always want to cover more serving at camps mm-hmm. and clinics, but it's such a tough skill because it's so individualized, you know, and it's not a very, it's not a very friendly group uh, learning experience. Uh, But especially if you're by yourself, this is a great episode to listen to, hopefully and get some ideas. And it's, it's a great thing that you can, it doesn't matter how many people you have with you, how many friends you have, uh, you can always go out there and work on your serve. So it's definitely a good topic. You know what makes it more friendly is the, the shagging nets or an indoor facility. Which yes. Is always nearby. I think when we're out on the beach, no one wants to practice serves because you end up shagging for more than half the time. So mm-hmm. it's unrewarding uh, in that aspect. And then if you assign somebody to be a passer on the other side, you know, if somebody's working on their serves, they right. might get one out of every five serves that they can actually touch. So it's one of those tough ones that, yeah, it takes time. It takes a lot of errors to make things fixed and the, the, the shagging, the ball collecting is just, it's a pain for groups, but the problem yeah. is that it's so massively crucial to winning and people just ignore it. The amount of lollipops and serves that hit people in the chest is it's absurd. Like the, the mm-hmm. level has to increase. Right. And it, it's the easiest, I think it's the easiest way for people to level up their game by themselves too. Mm. Like if you're, if you're playing in local tournaments and you're consistently getting ninths, fifths, whatever, and you can't break into that kind of podium finish of third, second, or first, I guarantee you that if you work on your serve and you go aggressive and you try to figure out a way to hit these serves harder and put more pressure on the passer, that's probably your easiest way of getting onto that podium other than obviously the the very the consistency touches of passing setting and attacking obviously those are always going to help but um yeah the serving alone is it's a really easy way and you can it's very easy to tell who is an experienced server and who is not when you're in the local tournaments yep and some people have patience some people have intentional patience and you can notice it um, mm-hmm. It was funny to hear DJ, who has quickly just risen to the top of our coaching staff, um, mm-hmm. that being incredible. Um, right. We're talking about Georgia Klasnik, who came from Serbia. He's now uh, in the U.S. and he's on a student visa, um, but he's competing because he says that there's no winter in Serbia, no winter beach volleyball. So he's come out to the U.S. and doing some schooling, doing some graduate assistant coaching, and uh, he's become an amazing coach for us. And Mm -hmm. he said that he was just baffled by the first time that he saw some of the American teams using these slow, deep lollipop serves. And as a young guy, uh, 
and, and, and like from the from the serbian mindset you know like kind of maybe that eastern european eastern block that's just pound 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 everything should be harder um that he was surprised that people were just using this he thought it was a joke and him and his teammates thought it was a joke and then he got deeper into strategy and he started understanding positioning offensive strategy defensive mindset and he's like ah okay I get it. You know, you, you still might not subscribe to some high, deep, slow lollipop serves or, or some short, easy ones, but knowing the principles behind it and then being able to take advantage of those, I think it's important either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I also think that just um, maintaining pressure is important as well. You know, I think a lot of the times, especially when we think about the longevity of a, of a match, uh, a consistent pressured serve is if you're going to get the other team to crack um, that that's something to think about as well. You know, I, I think a lot of us, we, and it's kind of the same thing. We've had these conversations before and I kind of, I can feel these conversations kind of interweaving. Um, mm -hmm. But we kind of abandon our strategy a little too quickly. You know, we think yeah. about something and then, it doesn't work the first couple times and then we start bailing. Whereas uh, someone we were talking about uh, that we were talking about Lev Prima at practice the other day, who has a, who has a great jump serve. And we were talking about how he doesn't necessarily like sometimes when he's on, he's on and he's crushing it. But um, most of the time, what he does is he just wears down passers. You know, he, he keeps it consistent. He makes these passers pass the ball throughout the entire match and that alone gets some passers to crack. So I, yeah, I think there's a lot of, a lot of different chapters or stories that we could talk about that could definitely increase a lot of people's serving technique and ideas behind serving. Cause a lot of us just, we still think about it as oh, the point zero, zero, here goes the first point, pop it in. Yeah. So, um, with all that talk of lolly and saucers, we are going to talk about just coaching cues to be able to help you guys hit harder. Things that we've used with players that we use with ourselves and uh, just kind of one to three word cues that are really going to add power and help you just increase velocity from your serve, from a float serve, from a jump float serve. And maybe we'll get into sky ball and uh, for a jump spike surf as well if you guys are interested in going through an entire serving course and learning how to jump float serve the sequence where to toss how high to toss all of the footwork and the different conditions that you can do it in we have a serving master class it is uh, actually if you buy it as a standalone course it's the least expensive thing that we have is 27 bucks and you can find that on betterreach.com forward slash store. But for a limited time right now, you guys can get every single one of our courses. Serve, receive, setting, attacking, fix your arm swing, 60-day max vertical, all for $39 a month. This is the cheapest that we've ever offered it. We're doing a one month test. We're going to see what happens at the end of February, but we want to get our members going. We want to see a lot of players jump in there. And for the current members, they're paying a lot less for what they're doing than this because those guys are paying $38 every two weeks, almost $76 a month. And what happens with them is they get all of the virtual coaching. So I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who have said, Hey, you know, I love the coaching system, but you didn't separate the actual virtual coaching from the courses. And a lot of people have trouble committing to doing the drills, showing up to the meetings, and then um, and being a part of the full thing. So they just wanted the course. So what we've done with we created a membership specifically for that. I heard you guys. I'm down with it. So it's $39 a month right now. That's that's definitely gonna be the cheapest that we ever offer. And uh, you get all of our courses that doesn't come with the online coaching. If you want virtual coaching, which comes with two meetings per week, 
and two group meetings per week and a private lesson, a private video lesson every month. Then you go to, uh, you can go to therapyshop.com forward slash store and you will see that. So now we've separated the two. You can just get the courses uh, and you can get the courses plus virtual coaching. That way for those people who lose out or they, they don't have that time commitment that they want, they can say, you know what? I don't want all of that personal hands-on customized instruction, but I do want to take part in those courses. I really want to see everything that we have to offer step-by-step step. and I want the drills. I want to be able to fix all of my techniques and everything at home. So we've got those two offers now. Betterbeach.com forward slash store. You can get for the first time all of our courses for only 39 bucks a month. So pretty excited about that. We are going to see how that goes, but uh, we're only offering it for this month. And by the time you hear this recorded podcast, it might be done. So um, jump on it at betterbeach.com forward slash store. And if you just want to try our server masterclass to see how it goes, you can buy that as a standalone course at that exact same spot. And you can learn all about server, which we're talking about today. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Nice. Okay. So let's get into it. Mm -hmm. Cues for serving harder. What do you think? Let's start with standing float serves. Okay. The first cue? Um, I see. I'm gonna go ahead, and this is a cue that was told to me, um, and it can be used on every single type of serve. So, um, and it doesn't really have to do with the hand contact. It has to do with the vision and the path that you plan this ball on traveling. So, I had a coach at one point tell me to, if you think about a volleyball net. You think about the two antennas that are obviously on the net. And then if you draw an imaginary line from the top of one antenna to the other antenna, in your mind, you should see another rectangle above the net, right? So a rectangle with the bottom being the top of the net, that imaginary line being the top of the net. And then the two antennas are obviously the two sides of that, of that rectangle. Um, I had a coach tell me that your, whatever type of serve that you were doing in order to put pressure on the other side of the net, whenever we're thinking about a serve that is, has power on it, that that serve needs to go through that um, rectangle that we have just drawn. So just above the net. I think a lot of us, we, we have these types of float serves where even where we're trying to make them difficult and fast is that there's too much of a peak on it where it, it cover it, it travels to the net and it crosses the net point maybe four or five feet above the top of the antenna. And so something that I, I challenge a lot of servers to, especially if we're focusing specifically on serving, is now that you've drawn that imaginary box above the net, now fill it with glass. And when you're back serving, it is your job to break that glass. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that if we can, as servers, can have that idea and we think about the power that is necessary to break that glass and we are, we're accurate enough to actually put the ball into that location, um, it's it's really hard to kind of miss your serve, to be honest. If we can do that, not only are you having to hit that ball at a pace that is quick enough to get it to that location without going above the height of the antenna, but also I've ha I have a lot of people saying, oh, if I do that, I'm going to miss the ball long. Um, if you try it, I, I, I can almost guarantee you the first couple of times you try it, you're probably going to miss in the net um, because you've changed that trajectory so much. But with cut clearing the net by that small amount, it's actually quite difficult to hit the ball long as well. So, uh, yeah, that's my first cue. I think think about the path that you want this ball to go on. And whenever I'm thinking about a hard serve, I draw that rectangle above the top of the net. I fill it with glass. And then I make sure that my serve has enough velocity to not only travel through that zone but also break the glass as well so i think uh that's my first thought when i'm when like i'm going that. to when i'm going to serve and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a standing float jump float top spin serve that that closeness to the net is very important 
And when I heard you first say that at camp, I was like, oh man, that's nice. Just imagining a thin sheet of glass and saying like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna break it. Uh, one of my favorite and probably the simplest one that I've heard, and I'm gonna, I'm writing these all down. And mm -hmm. uh, if you guys watch the recorded version and you're listening to this on a podcast, I'm hoping that underneath in the show notes, I have something downloadable for you. Uh, we're going to write down all of our favorite coaching cues for increasing arm swing and serving power. So just check the show notes and we might have a little goodie there for you, but we're going to write all these down. Uh, one of my favorite ones was from Jeff Alzina, who is a USA high performance coach. He was in charge of USA national teams. He was in charge of um, the Greek Olympic team. And he just said, hang it, P-I-N-G, ping it. And when he gave me that cue to, to just imagine just a little bit more sharpness, adding just a little quick, quicker hit instead of that kind of slow, methodical arm swing that we're used to with a smooth float serve, that turned me on to say, like, all right. I get how this should come off my hands if I'm trying to put some quickness on it. And as simple as it sounds, ping it just really works for me. And I think when you ask some athletes to do that, they kind of get it. it. It rings true for them. So mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite cues, ping it. I like that. I, I've heard it somewhat similar. And you know how the ball deflates a little bit when you make contact? Yeah. So like some of my favorite pictures of beach volleyball. Yeah, right. Um, some of my favorite pictures in beach volleyball is when somebody is making contact with the ball and it is like it almost looks like the ball is flat, uh, like they're they're manipulating the shape of the ball. Uh, and when I think about ping it, something that was told to me when I was learning how to float serve was instead of thinking about hitting the actual side of the ball that you plan on contacting, think about hitting this ball so quick and stopping so fast that you're actually contacting the other side of the ball. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to explain a little bit, but like yeah. if for all my people watching, like if this is the ball and my contact point is here, like I'm not allowed to follow through, but instead of trying to hit this side of the ball, I'm actually going to try to hit make contact with this side of the ball. So it turns into this quick little ping or pop. Um, and if you can imagine that ball, kind of deflating and my hand actually being able to touch the other side of the ball, the power that's going to establish after that with the ball taking off, off my hand is obviously going to create some, some speed as well. So I, I like that ping it. And it, for some reason, like when you say ping it, if you play volleyball, it just, it makes sense, right? Yeah. You're just like, okay, yeah, I'll just ping it. <laughs> you think about those old school balls that actually had that ping sound. That boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Tachikara. Oh yeah, they're still out there. They're still doing I know that's what I that's what I played my high school games with. Yeah, Wilson's on a on a mission to be the, the ultimate dominant volleyball. For, yeah, I wonder for what they're. Now. I think they're coming out with some indoor balls as well. Um, better ones. Oh really? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I like so that. I, I like yours and. One of the ways, the, the one that I wrote down is like hitting that second face of the ball is, okay, when you toss it, there is a ball behind your actual ball. Hit the second ball when you're yes. thinking of that swing. And okay. you take that from, from martial arts, uh, like I'm not sure if it was Tyson or Muhammad Ali, but they said like when you hit somebody, hit the back of their skull. Like don't, mm -hmm. don't try to touch their face. Because that's what happens. That's when you lose power is when you just stop right at the face of something and you don't follow through. Uh, mm -hmm. We were told this growing up in baseball. Uh, we were told this in football. You know, keep driving through, tackle the guy behind the guy. And that will give you that power instead of you know, expecting to have an energy stop as soon as you contact. So yeah. all of these things, this is all sports. Just being able to continue your power and your momentum through that initial contact point is massive so um hit the hit the other side of the volleyball hit the second volleyball however you got to think about it just keep following through and that should add power i like it um i think something that i would 
like to touch on next. So maybe we can kind of go move this on to our third queue. And it, it's an issue that I see with a lot of people with inconsistent serves all around is just actually knowing what your hand should feel like. Mm. Um, I think a lot of us, we, we think about our arm swing so much because that's what's generating power. Uh, but we forget that, especially with a float serve, um, how hard your hand is, is actually very important. Um, so I actually, the video that I was referencing that I posted today on my Instagram is very simple. Um, I even referenced Kyle Stevenson, who is one yes. of my best buds. Uh, and if you clap your hands, and normally when people clap their hands, I call this the rosy clap because he's the only person I know that claps with his fingers like this. Um, Rosie. Rosie, when he gets points, he, cra he claps like this. He doesn't clap like this, really? like a normal person. He puts <laughs> yeah. his fingers together? Yep. Watch, watch him clap. That's um, really strange. Maybe he's yeah. playing a lot of golf and that's how they're like trained to. Oh, yeah. He is a big golfer. Clap. Yeah. Um, but back to he's it. Down the block. You, I'll literally go and <laughs> Right. <laughs> normally we block, normally we, uh, when we clap our hands, our fingers touch, but if you can think about pulling your fingers back and now clapping, and now it's only the palms of your hands that are touching. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the shape that our hand, that's what our hands should feel like a little bit more when we're actually contacting the ball. Uh, Kyle Stevenson has made it great. We use this all the time where he says hamburger, which is the palm of your hand no french fries which are your fingers so mm -hmm. when you are hitting a float serve uh we've gone into a lot more depth with this in a previous episode about serving um, where mark actually talks about where you should be contacting that ball on that on that hamburger of your hand um but i think for a quick reference if you think about making that hand rigid and making that contact point happen on your palm then that's what's going to give it give you the ability to make that ping, which is going to give you the velocity that you need to break that glass. So we're just going, you know, we're stepping one step at a time. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of us, we go in with this kind of loose hand where now this ball is going to be contacted by almost all of our fingers or our fries and that hamburger or our palm. So if we can make that hand a little bit more structured and allow that ball to pop off your hand rather than you hitting it, uh, then I think that that's setting ourselves up already for more velocity. I get. Uh, I'm going to give two in a row here because they they can conflict, but one of them is this is a gold medal term, right? It's toss, step, and hit. Very simple way to explain it, sir. Stepping mm -hmm. forward with your left foot, right? So step forward with your left foot. That creates this forward momentum through the ball but right away i'm going to say another one that won't be the same but it might work for a different player just leave your feet still leave them parallel and see if you can use torque by rotating your torso so toss rotate hit right both of these, and especially the rotate part, uh, for people who aren't experienced with throwing sports, uh, didn't play a lot of Little League or football or, or tennis or any, anything that, that involves overhand throwing and going up and they're just trying to learn how to develop some rotation and power. See if you can leave your feet parallel, throw the ball over your right shoulder, really rotate your chest back without moving your feet and practice generating the torque and the rotational power from your midsection. So the first one, toss, step with your left, that creates that forward momentum shift that's gonna add some power. Um, and then you can leave the ball a little bit more in front of you. But the second one is leave your feet parallel, toss, rotate, hit. And feeling the, the twisting in your kind of low back in your obliques, is going to help you start to get the sensation for when they move up to max power. And for a float serve, that might be somebody's maximum power. But teaching them how to rotate and use their body from the trunk is it's just massive for you know all sports there, all throwing sports. Yeah, and if if you're at home, 
right now, I think, I think it's important to even just try this, you know? So if you're at home right now and you're, whether hopefully you're, if you're, if you're driving, keep driving safely. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're at home, but when you're you, in reverse, yeah, <laughs> if you're sitting at your chair and your, mm-hmm. your legs are facing the computer, then giving this little twist, you can already start to feel these stretches that your body is like, are you sure you want to do this? But I, I kind of, I, I always compare that to a rubber band, you know, a rubber band says the same question, you know, when it starts to get stretched, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, I want to get back to this normal version of myself and we're the same way. So like when, when we, talk. yeah, I like to get, boy, <laughs> when I we like can to personify get, rubber bands. <laughs> yeah. A, Cause I, I know, they, I know what they're thinking. I know what they're thinking. Um, <laughs> But if if we can allow our bodies to be that rubber band and open up, then that's what gives us that shooting forward motion to kind of, and that's that's how we get that power. Obviously, I think all of us, unless you were studying too hard in school, you've probably shot a rubber band at somebody. Um, I'm sure I've gotten in trouble for it more than I should have. Um, but the the longer you pull it back, the further it's going to go. You know, it's one of the easiest science experiments that you did as a kid. So it's the same kind of thing. If you're serving and you don't get any trunk rotation, then you're not shooting a rubber band very far. But if you can allow that trunk rotation to open up as far as possible, then that's when you're getting the most elasticity out of your body. And once you get that stretched out, it's got to come back. So, um, if you guys were able to do that, you should have felt it's, it's a lot of mobility too, because there's sometimes where I can't do it. Um, but if you work on it, then it, it allows you to do that a lot better. For sure. Okay. Um, I, you know what I like, I like loose arm, solid hand. Mm-hmm. Loose arm solid hand is a really nice cue to get people thinking of, I don't know, because a lot of people will, uh, when you say solid their hand, like we talked about, um, I wrote down here, muscleize your hand, and I wrote down yours, which is clap your hands together, but clap without your fingers, all both mm-hmm. good cues. But when people solid their hand, then you start feeling tension in your forearms, and that forearm tension translates to your upper arm. And maybe your entire body starts unconsciously tensing and that creates a slower contact, right? Your arm will move slower through the ball. So I like to remind people that if they're float serving, especially their hand needs to be solid, but their arm should be loose and fast. So loose arm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when you teach, when you teach this, when I've seen you teach teach it before, when you to the person behind, I think that that's a really good cue with with this topic as well because um, it's it's hard to uh, especially when you're in a loose hand or sorry a strict hand and then a loose arm it's hard to have have one thing on your really strict which is your hand and then relaxing everything else Um, but I think if you if everyone puts their hand behind them and waves like they have a person behind them this is the first time i've actually gotten the video right um then this is a really good way to allow these muscles to loosen up with with your bicep and tricep and shoulder and but it still allows you to keep that hand strict Uh, that's like one of the my favorite things that you talk about when you're coaching um, because having a loose arm will allow you to speed up if you're if you're strict and you feel like you're flexing and like trying to show everybody how big your bicep is then you're already slowing yourself down but yeah. when you have that loose arm it's pretty cool it's uh it's it always reminds me just like go ahead no go uh it, it always it works great with with kids and adults kids especially it's like mm-hmm. present the ball to the person in front of you wave to the person behind you you know and, and getting them to to get in that that position already works then you know you're gonna have to make little details and say like okay don't like stick your hand out but keep your arm at 90 degrees when you go you know, do the, uh, mm-hmm. what do you call it the parade wave ah the stuff. parade wave yeah. <laughs> yeah and it i always relate it to when you look at 
volleyball players, yes, a lot of us, a lot of them are extremely toned, right? Like they look strong, but there's not a whole lot of volleyball players who are extremely jacked, you know? Uh, like we don't have a whole lot of like bodybuilder looking people playing beach volleyball. So we necessarily be acting like we're super strong when we're doing movements. You know, there's a, there's a reason that we hear the word noodly a lot, you know, like when we think of the Andes and the Logans and the, even the tribe and uh, like, I think the biggest person I can think of right now is like Avery, who's just big on when you look at pictures, but when you're next to him on the beach, he's, he's still a, a thinner person, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think we get in trouble when we try to, when we try to make our body something that they're not, especially in the sport of beach volleyball. Trying to flex it too hard. Right. Be Don't too flex. strong instead of fast. Right. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Um, do you have any, any more that have to do with like technique and style as far as what, what you're going to do with your body? Well, I want to give those, those quick two solutions that, that you were able to give to Tanya when she added her power. Mm -hmm. um, and we had this wave hello behind us. And then for some people who have mobility and arm speed issues, it's tough on them to start in that position, similar to a rubber band. Like if you pull and immediately release, it's going to go further than if you pull, hold, and then release, right? So if you're able to stretch and fire immediately using, using that energy in your muscles, the elastic energy, then you can probably hit harder. So for some people, holding their arms up doesn't allow their whole body to be loose. So at one point, and it was so unique and we were all stoked when you gave it, but you told Tanya to leave her arm dangling by the side and then just kind of wiggle it out before she tossed with her left hand. Mm -hmm. Then toss, then get the arm up and fire. And that forced her whole arm to have to move faster because she, she knew she had to get it back and she knew she had to get it through. And it increased her stretch potential and it increased her arm speed. Uh, but it was the first time that I saw somebody successfully be able to get somebody to add arm speed by having their arm dangle by their side first. And it was such a unique coaching point, coaching situation, and it provided a crazy good result uh, where she wasn't getting power otherwise. So kudos to you on a, a, a fun but really smart way to get somebody to loosen up. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, and I'm not a huge body mechanic type of person, but I, I see it a lot in, in females. Um, and it, a lot of it has to do with strength and, and mobility, you know, and I think it's, especially when we're talking about Tanya in this specific instance, um, I think she was almost taking power away from herself when she was doing this initial setup because she didn't allow her body to go through the natural movement of what her arm swing was. Um, mm. So I think with, with that little fix, I was more, I was more looking to see what her natural arm swing was um, because she was fighting so hard to make it exactly what you hear on YouTube and, and, and everything like that. Um, yeah. And it's just a good reminder that even though there are a lot of keys and cues that are used around the world for every single person volleyball is still an individual sport our bodies are still a little different my body can do things a little different than mark's can mark can do a, a lot of things different than i can um so once we get to these little fine fixes that are past the basic keys of passing setting hitting serving then it becomes the coach's job to look at individual movements um and I, I think that that's kind of what I was focusing on with that. Um, and it was just my way of trying to increase her knowledge and my knowledge as well of how her body moved in that specific situation. So, um, yeah, uh, thank we, you. When we did a, when we recorded the course for Fix Your Arm Swing in 10 Days, when we created that big, heavy recorded portion, 
we added a bunch of her privates trying to get her to teach her body torque, hip and shoulder separation, and we included a number of really useful exercises in that long private session. So if you're somebody who's looking to gain power or you can't figure out how to get more power on your serve or you know somebody, say it's your, your kid um, or just somebody who doesn't, you don't think that they have the strength to get the ball over, it's not about strength, it's about your nervous system. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really recommend our course, Fix Your Arm Swing in 10 Days. Uh, it's got all of the rotational drills for you, all of the throwing drills, all of the swinging drills, and all of the cues that you'll need to gain power on your serve and your swing. So uh, if you want to check that out, of course, it's available at betterbeach.com forward slash store. If you want to look at the details of it and what everything that goes into that course, just check out betterbeach.com forward slash fix your volleyball arm swing. The long one. Um, we could have mm -hmm. Swing, <laughs> but <laughs> arm swing. You know. uh, yeah, but you, we you like to it. like to make it work for it. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think that especially kind of moving through, you've called me out on this a few. Times, thrown a ball, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a seven-year-old or an eighty-year-old person. Is that and that's surprise? It's still surprising to me, yeah. but I know that you it's true. Practiced. We've all thrown a football 40 yards. Right? Yeah, I've, so I've said it at like camps. That. I've said it in videos. <laughs> I've said it a lot. And it's it's just like, it. it's hard for me to think about it. But if you're one of those people that has never thrown a ball, then it's crazy to think, especially for the sport of beach volleyball, you have to learn how to throw before you can think about having a good arm swing. Mm -hmm. Because they're so closely correlated that – if you don't have knowledge of one or of, of the throwing style before the arm swing, then you're you're kind of that's that's when you can really get hurt um, because you're you're trying to do all these things and shoulder injuries are not fun. Um, so if you're one of those people that doesn't know how to throw and you think you struggle with an arm swing, I'm telling you right now that you're actually in a good position, but you need to learn how to throw. So this, the course that Mark Mark was talking about, how to fix your arm swing in ten, ten days, it was literally built to teach people how to throw. Um, it's teaching you how to open up your torso, exercises that you can do to strengthen your shoulder, uh, and it gives you the, the exercises along the way. It was fun to make. Yeah. So and my favorite part about that is when people come back after. Uh, checking out the videos for fixing your arm swing and the cues that we give and they go bro <laughs> first time i've swung as hard as i can at a volleyball it came off of my arm faster and there was no pain like they're <laughs> shocked when you use the right mechanics how we can eliminate pain so last night i went through and uh i just changed the title of the course a little bit because of all the feedback that we got and one of their favorite parts, aside from the added power, <clears throat> aside from the added power, was that there's no pain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, because now you're using the right muscles. You're allowing your body to swing. You're not forcing it to swing. And uh, so now we've changed it to uh, fix your arm swing in ten days, uh, increase velocity, eliminate pain, and that's what has happened to all of the people who have taken that course. So we might as well give them a new real nickname. So if you got shoulder pain, I like it. There's a good answer. Anyway, um, let's get back to some great coaching cues, and maybe, maybe we can go straight into jump serving here since we're running a little low on time. Because I okay. think a lot of those cues that we gave were pretty good for jump floats. And if you do yeah. want to increase jump float, I would just say jump into the court would be my fastest. So mm -hmm. all right, I'll give you two lead yourself with your toss and then i'll say jump into the court for a jump float serve if you want to learn how to jump float serve again we have that uh, course waiting for you at betterbeach.com store it is difficult <laughs> to to get the jump serve sequence going i remember how frustrating it was uh, in, in high school and college just getting that sequence down but we built a nice little, little jump float. So uh, jump floats, lead yourself with your toss, and jump or land into the court. You got any quick hitters for jump floats or power? Uh, 
it, it can be used for jump floats and for top spin serves when we're talking about a top spin is that remember that your footwork should allow you to get to your toss not not your toss should match um i think that that's that's a a key to pick up on i i've seen a lot of people i've still doing 75 hard i'm uh i think i'm on day 38 or 39 right now and so one of the workouts that i, I think do you're sometimes doing two is, workout programs at the same time you're, yeah you're it's kind of helping it's helping, helping me out it's helping me knock off a couple things but um one thing i've been doing is if i if i have like a rest day then one of my workouts is a 45 minute walk and i'll go and i'll just walk the strand and i'll a lot of times i'm seeing people and I've seen a couple of people that are getting coached on how they're serving. And one of the big errors that I see is that when people start to try to do a jump float or, a, or a jump top spin serve, is they try to get their toss to match their steps, which means that you have to be a perfect tosser. And if you've ever been to any volleyball practice or have been a part of any training, you know that the toss is probably the hardest part. If a drill is going to break down at a at one of our practices, it's because somebody doesn't know how to toss. Mm -hmm. And I think that we put a little bit too much emphasis on making the toss perfect. I know that that's something that a lot of coaches teach. It starts with the toss, and it does. I'm not changing that at all. But I think we need to put more emphasis on our feet, getting you to the correct spot. So. Uh, if you have one of these low, like the first person that comes to mind that is very hard is Chris Vaughn. You know, he's got that float serve that it's almost like a running, it's a, it's a jump float, but his toss matches his feet perfectly every single time. But that is so hard to do. What I suggest is when you're starting out, allow your toss a little bit higher so that you can use your feet to get you to the location to have the optimal height that you're trying to contact the ball to have your body behind the ball and allow yourself to jump into the court um then you're not whiffing the ball completely because your toss was off make your toss so like with a jump float serve your footwork should be step step toss last two steps so you're you're kind of stalling on that second step you see your toss, and then you should use your last two steps, just like an approach, to be aggressive and go get it. With the top spin serve, you're kind of making that toss on your timing step of your four-step approach. Or if you're going a lower toss because it's windy, it might be on your left step or your second step. But um, once again, I think if you can use that toss and then use your feet to go get the ball, it's a it's a, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to move on to, to jump serving. I like it. I'm ready too. I like wiggling my arm at my side before my serve. Okay. To, to let myself know, hey, you have to be loose here. So my coaching cue, it's something that I give myself. I actually haven't given this to many players, but I give it to myself every time I'm ready to rip. I start wiggling my arm. Wiggle your arm hmm. before you toss. And I'm sure you've seen me kind of like doing it. And some people might think that I'm in pain, but there I'm telling myself because I'm fired up and I, and I know that I want to hit a hard serve. And historically, my body has interpreted like my mental messages. And my mental message says, hit this ball hard. And my body flexes. It gets juiced up and it starts flexing. And that creates uh, a big slowdown because I'm not using stretch or velocity. And when you flex, you really become shorter. If you think about like squeezing your upper body muscles, your body kind of crunches into itself. So it doesn't allow you to really get up there. Like when I flex my lat here, I drop about a half an inch um, just by doing that with your arm muscles. So it'll make you shorter and it'll make you slower if you don't keep your arm loose. So uh, one of my favorite cues that I give to myself is I let my arm dangle and wiggle at my side before the serve. I like that. I'll have to keep an eye on that. You know, let it, I'll you let know when the, when the cannon's coming. I'm like a dog. <laughs> I've got a big tail. 
<laughs> I like it. Oh man, that's funny. Um, something that I was I was told uh, that I I don't, I don't jump serve a whole lot. Um, I did when I was playing indoor, and something that I focused on a lot for me that helped with my consistency is I I noticed that a lot of times when when I tried to hit a ball as hard as I possibly could, I I would get this big left shoulder dip um mainly because i'm reaching i think i'm trying to reach really high with my right hand and instead of staying tall with my chest i i tend i i was ended up dropping my left shoulder so that my shoulders were almost in line like uh with my body and i had one coach that was working i was missing a lot of jump serves when i when i hit them right they were great but when i missed it was ugly and i had one coach that told me to try my best while still trying to reach as high as i could trying my best to keep my shoulders level um and because obviously when you when you reach for a ball even when i'm looking at myself in, in the camera it still looks like there's this di diagonal uh kind of line but it's a yeah, lot no. better than than this you know um mm -hmm. so i and i think it, it helps you with your contact point i think it helps you with your velocity forward um and it, it doesn't and it also doesn't make you lose sight because i think a lot of times when we reach really high our our eyesight tends to go down so now we're actually making contact with this ball not looking at it mm -hmm. and i think if you can kind of keep the shoulder level and then think about trying to get your chest this is something that Tom, thomas our our old guy uh used to tell us is that if your chest had a diamond or something on it and you could think about getting that diamond to the ball and then going through the swing rather than just getting that attacking shoulder to the ball um it'll can it'll make your attack a little bit cleaner I do like that. It'd be the diamond reference. And we, we, we might catch, I hope we get a lot of commentary on this because a lot of coaches and players will say, yeah, teach your players to dip their left shoulders you know, mm -hmm. so that you can reach higher. Don't teach your players to drop their left shoulder. Just teach them to reach their right shoulder higher, as high as you can. Like you're trying to reach something up in the sky. And you know, if you don't stay level, if you slightly tilt, that's fine. But when you train somebody to <laughs> to go to the bad side of what they're trying to accomplish, we're trying to get them to reach high and you're telling them to reach low, that's going to create a bad situation. Having this tall reach and then reaching up higher and extending through your spine, extending through your thoracic, thoracic and opening your chest to that ball is huge. And people just keep on giving this miscue of drop your left shoulder, drop your left shoulder. Don't teach your players to be shorter. Don't teach them to hit lower. Just say reach as high as you can. And that can provide some assistance. And that might prevent keeping what you're saying, keeping your shoulders a little bit more level. That might prevent that heavy drop. And kind of naturally, you're going to stay tall. And as far as the, the diamond in the middle of the chest, that's one of my favorite. Like, shine, shine bright like a diamond. Yeah. Get that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a great singer. Uh, I don't even know if those are the words. <laughs> shine bright like a diamond. Oh, okay, yeah. Come on. Man. Hashtag Rihanna, Chris Brown. Is that who you know? Yeah. I'm not a big pop coach. Um, umbrella. Okay. <laughs> We're just saying words now. <laughs> uh, bringing your chest up through the ball shining that diamond getting the middle of your chest to the ball it's a big cue for hitting hard and staying tall i also like to say like an iron man chest you know if you got that laser in the middle of your chest like iron man uh bringing that to the ball like you're trying to shine it uh mm. shine your chest laser on the ball it, one that the same guy thomas gave to a lot of our players was go up and when you hit actively bite the ball as if you're trying to take a giant bite out of the ball when you're about to hit it or when you're contacting it, that keeps your chest up, it keeps your neck up, it keeps your head up. And so many people are just getting this whole crunch and pike advice. 
and it has to stop. <laughs> it has to mm-hmm. stop making people so much shorter. Um, we want to stay as tall as we can through our swing in most situations, unless you somehow have to contort your body to get your arm up, but your body has to be lower, right? We want to stay tall. So imagine there's a diamond in the middle of your chest, um, Iron Man chest, or go up and bite the ball on contact. Or if you've got one of these sweet better beach shirts, it has the volleyball on here, and you can think about getting the volleyball to the volleyball. I don't know. That's just something I'm thinking of right now that if you don't have a shirt, that's a reason to go get one. You are getting good at these segues. Hey, <laughs> I'm bad at one. I'm in. <laughs> go to betterbeach.com forward slash shop. And uh, yeah. yeah, you'll be able to get yourself some some cool better at beach gear. Yeah. Only if you want to be better at hitting. You got to get a shirt. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Tower on okay. serve. Last little bit. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is a tricky one that... Um, I'm I'm still kind of playing around with, but it has to. We we already talked about the hand contact for a float serve, okay? And uh, but now we're talking about a jump serve that does have to change a little bit. Um, we're not going to go as strict with our hand. We still want to be big and we want to be able to grab, but our wrist has to be able to move a little bit. So I had one one of my coaches. I I think it was Freddie um, when he was talking about arm swing. He talked about imagine if your hand is attached to your arm by velcro and when you go to swing you're trying to throw your hand off of your arm by releasing that velcro okay so all those tendons all those tendons are gone everything like you're trying to throw your hand so hard that it's the hand is actually going to come off of your arm because it's only attached by velcro not not your actual hand but it would separate and that is going to allow you to have a loose wrist and it gets that natural top spin to the ball so i'm still playing around with that a little bit i'll kind of I'll, I'll give you guys a debrief next week when i get on here okay. um but i think that that's a really good idea because it allows us to get that loose arm that we're talking about or being noodly um the only issue that i have had with it so far is that sometimes when I think about throwing my wrist like that, my hand gets a little small and I'm missing my contact a little bit. So, um, but when I do get it all right and I feel that whip, the ball explodes off my hand a lot faster. So I, I kind of, I just wanted to bring that little point up. It's something that I'm still currently working on and still kind of diving into a little bit, but the, I think the picture of it and the feeling of it uh, is pretty easy to find. I like that. Yeah. I, I like the... <laughs> and the Velcro, I, I... Ace, I just, sorry, Ace, I just saw your comment. Um, the Velcro would be between, so like imagine if I cut off my hand right at my wrist and I pulled my hand up and I just had my arm here with a, with a nub and... I would attach my hand back so it looked completely normal, but there would be Velcro in between my my wrist, between separating my hand and my arm. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you if you if you got that. <laughs> I got it. I'm not the smartest. But yeah. Hey. I like uh, whipping a really tall person in the butt. I don't know why I say it like this. Butt. Cracks me <laughs> up. <laughs> When you said, I love this. this <laughs> but like, imagine there's like a giant, it's, I don't know, two or three times the size of you and like you're whatever in the locker room and you want to give them a rat tail. So you want to whip them with a towel and you want to hear that pop of that towel. Think about going up and you have to whip up. And I think people swing and they don't remember to whip and all of this looseness that we're talking about a lot that has to develop that whip. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold the ball in front of a player and I'll, I'll put them on their knees and I'll just hold the ball really high and I'll say, make it pop. I want, I want to hear this thing hit this ball hard. And that gets them going velocity from the elbow back position to the elbow up position. And that's where you have to develop velocity. 
because if you only start developing velocity when your arm is contacting the ball, so many people because of mobility, that they start increasing velocity after contact or on the way down. But everything, all of the speed increase has to happen when your humerus or when your bicep and tricep muscles are behind your chest. That is where the speed has to generate here, where your hand is coming from behind. But if, you're, if your hand is kind of equal with your chest, your torso, and then you start trying to generate speed, you won't have the time and space to get you from zero to 60. Like you need to be zero to 60 when your hand and elbow are behind you, not once they're next to you. So having that space behind you to develop that, that getting that whip or whipping a really tall person in the butt, uh, that's one of the, the cues that I use. It might work for nobody, but at least it gets a smile on it. You know, I, I the way that you say, act like you're whipping someone in the butt, that just makes me laugh a lot. But um, I've seen this in person. I've seen other coaches do it. And it is one of the coolest things that I've seen of transitioning an arm swing to look correct. Um, mm -hmm. When DJ was made famous for it at one of our last camps for <laughs> taking his shirt off mid lesson. I just imagine the, the sexy music playing now. <laughs> it was in slow motion and he was already oiled. <laughs> right. Um, but if he, if when he's doing that and, and allowing these people to get that whip motion down it, the technical stand from a technical standpoint the arm swing looks really really nice yeah, yeah. whip up not forward um okay and the last one that that i'm that i'll give is definitely for my for my jump serve and this came directly from Isaac Nubel of Torque VB. If you guys are looking for him on Instagram, it's at T-O-R-Q-V-B. -B. Great arm swing specialist. And one of the cues that he gives is when you jump, start by pushing your right hip through the ball. So on takeoff, if you, if you act like you're trying to take off more, from your right leg than you are from your left by pushing forward, getting your body to rotate from the ground and then dropping that shoulder back. So there's this counter rotation where your right hip goes forward, but your right shoulder goes back. That creates that oblique stretch that we were talking about a lot. When I get myself to push off of my right harder on my jump serves, I get a way better stretch and I get way more power. And it's because of that exaggerated stretch. And so many people think about hitting with their hips because so many coaches talked about hitting with your hips uh, along the last 20 years. Isaac was the first one who verbally made it make sense. He said, you can't jump and then throw your hips. It's just not something that you can do to gain power. The initial spin or rotational power has to come from somewhere and that has to come from your takeoff so if you push a little bit extra you squeeze that right glute just a little bit more and you make that right hip go forward on takeoff so long as you can still reach back with your right shoulder and your right elbow that additional stretch that's caused by your hips pushing forward that's going to give you a lot of power and i know that that has <laughs> given me a good source of power and a good cue for myself for serving. So push off harder from your right leg or from your trail leg, which, which if you're lefty, it's your left leg. But get your right foot to push harder and get your right hip to push forward. That's good. I miss Isaac. Might have to get him back out there one of these days. Yeah. Right. And so we've got 20, 20 cues. It's pretty good for increasing the velocity of the service line. Yeah. You got 21 or are we good? Uh, I'll give one quick one, especially when you're thinking about jump serving, is uh, it, don't try to hide where you're serving too much. 
You know, I think a lot of us, we, we try to go with these wrist aways or these cross body type serves to catch the passers off balance or something like that. Um, when you're starting out and you're trying to get velocity, point exactly where you're trying to serve. Because when you're trying to beat a server with velocity, you're, you're challenging them saying, hey, I'm going to hit this ball harder than you can pass. It's not saying, hey, I'm going to hit this ball hard and you're not going to know where I'm hitting it. Um, that has to do a little bit more with accuracy. So when we're going with velocity, if you plan on serving that ball down the seam, go ahead and make your shoulders face down the seam. If you plan on serving that left sideline and you're standing on the right sideline, go ahead and face that left sideline. That way you're taking away one of the movements. You're you're trying to beat them with speed and power rather than um, kind of trickery. Yeah. So, and whenever we do trickery, whether we like it or not, we put our body into a specific position that makes serving a little bit more difficult. So if you can just, wherever you plan on serving, face that, allow your approach to go towards that location as well, and then truly beat them with velocity. Don't try to add any more to it. Okay, guys. So um, just a few announcements from us again. Uh, on sale right now, you can get every single one of our skill and strategy courses for only $39 a month. Check that out at fitterpeach.com forward slash store. If you want to add on personalized coaching, where we have two small group meetings per week, you get to upload your videos, we get to go through your matches, your practices, your arm swing and coach you on it, then you can also sign up for that. And you get one private lesson, one one-on-one -on -one lesson with a coach from our team uh, every month. You can add that on to that course bundle. And it's at an all-time low right now at $39 a month. We invite you to be a part of it and see what it's all about. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of content, but we want you to focus on what you want to do. So if you want to get better at passing, we got that. Setting, we got that. Arm swing specifically. Of course, attacking and offensive strategy. Our defensive course. Then our blocking and peeling course. And our serving course. Along with the ever popular 60 day max vertical jump program with your nutrition performance nutrition plan. So all of that available. Clinics coming up around the country. We've locked a lot in. Uh, we got a private event coming up in Santa Monica. The week after that, we are going to Salt Lake City. After that, we are headed to uh, Grand Sands in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, outside it's in Loveland. Then we're going to Ozark, Missouri, Huntsville, Alabama, Long Island, New York, and Westchester, New York. And we are looking to add just a couple more in between this new AVP schedule. So if you want to bring us out for a clinic, we will bring a team of coaches. We have an organized, fantastic system with fantastic coaches. And it is seven and a half hours. If you can get at least 12 people to sign on for a full day, we can send you one coach. And if you want to get a bigger group, more than welcome. So if you've got a court, if you've got a facility, if you've got a public park and you know you can get access to permits, uh, get in touch. Shoot us an email at support at betterbeach.com or you can just fill out the form on betterbeach.com forward slash clinics. If you don't want to organize, but you just want to take a weekend trip to a volleyball destination, same thing. Sign up. There's a guy from... Uh, New New Mexico, who's coming up to Utah, and he's just like, yeah, seven and a half hours of training. Why wouldn't I? So he's taking a little drive up and uh, giving some snowboarding at the same time. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. All right, Brandon, y'all good? All good. Good session. Got a lot of cues in there. We did a, we did yeah. a little piece of our homework while <laughs> right while doing some podcast. I like it. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Okay. Uh, that's it. Guys, we are going to do a little bit of Q&A for anyone here who is uh, with us live. And aside from that, this summer we'll and this spring. We'll see you on the sand. Oh, maybe. <laughs> All right. Any Q&A, we're going to go through it just a little bit here. Oh, Ace. All right. uh, do you know who Ace is? Um, uh, John Drake's wife. Are we so sure? We're going to see her in Grand Sands. I'm almost oh, nice. Sure. 
Yeah. I, I'm wondering if this is, we have uh, an ace that is coming to our camp uh, in April. And I thought that this might have been the ace that is signed up for our clinic um, or for our camp that met like Allie and Jane or Allie and Logan in Mexico. But I could be wrong. Either way, okay. Ace, hopefully I meet I you soon. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Rick Smart. said we use hammer the ball, um, like you're holding a hammer in your hand and having to mash a nail high in the wall. I kind of like that. You know, hard hammer yeah. through the wall. Uh, so long as you're not actually having them use the back of their, their karate chop part of their fist, that's good. Right. Rob, like we that. appreciate you. Thanks. Mark Zim, we got to give him his, his uh, time in the spotlight here. He's mm -hmm. 100% on the I know. Love him. Our mantra for the high school players, many new to the game, was serve games. Trying to get them to rank serving as a priority because they always want to work on hitting. Do you think a foundational serve to learn in the standing float serve i tend to have them get that down first um there's a couple things that i really like about this comment um the first is the fact that you brought up mantra i think before a serve happens a little mantra is great uh whatever a server needs to do for from as elementary if they're talking about their hand contact to sometimes you'll notice at the at like an AVP tournament, people will take that big deep breath, allowing themselves to kind of think about what they want to do next. Um, just giving them that little bit of time to focus on what they need to do to accomplish that serve. Uh, I think every coach should develop mantras before they are serving or passing or whatever struggle uh, a play an individual player is having. Um, as far as do you think a foundational serve to learn is a standing float serve? I do. I, I think. I will always start with a standing float serve, mainly because it's easier to practice the the contact and the arm swing necessary for a float serve without having a person jump. Um, once they get that arm swing down and they get the contact point down, then we can start adding movement to their approach and a jump and then keep going to where eventually now they're doing a full top spin serve. But yeah, I think the progression is exactly what you would think it would be. Standing float serve, jump float serve, jump top spin serve in that order. Okay. I'm going to add to that slash slash counter it. Uh, I will always teach a float serve first, but as early as I possibly can, I'm going to teach people how to jump serve mm -hmm. because when you jump serve, you have the ability to practice spiking in a more game-like, more realistic environment. So while we might not focus from the serve standpoint, I'm going to teach people how to jump serve really early. That way they can start running their own drills better. Uh, every time they attempt to jump serve because they know how, they're getting their first, they're getting another attempt at real spike footwork with double arm lift and jump mechanics and everything. So I'll always start, yes, the foundation 100%, but I don't wait until they've mastered or until I love their float serve to introduce the spike serve. Um, <clears throat> I will slow them down a little bit if they're ruining a practice or ruining a drill and say, like, you can't miss nine out of 10 jump serves, but I'll introduce the skill so that they have something that they can do on their own and they can work and they're working on two skills at that point. They're working on serving and they're working at spiking. So I really do like to not wait to introduce that. And I don't care how old you are, but like my four and five year old nieces, yeah, they're gonna learn how to throw a ball really high, try to get their little toes off the ground and slam that ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think it's just about challenging your players too, you know? Um, if they're at a point where they're consistently hitting a serve, then and they have the ability to add a jump and do a jump spin serve, then obviously they need to learn it. Uh, one of my favorite things that I used to do as a, when I coached my middle school girls team um, was before every single water break, I would choose a different girl that had to perform a serve. And 
either they had to, and I would put them in front of the whole team, and I would even make the team do a slow clap just to up the pressure a little bit. And I would, I would allow them to say, all right, uh, I would tell them that they're jump serving, whether they're jump serving, jump floating, or, or standing float serves. And then I would allow them to pick the location on the court that they were going to hit. Mm-hmm. And if they, if they hit it, then obviously there was no punishment. If they didn't hit it, I never punished them. Um, but getting that idea in, in their heads of, okay, this is a pressured serve that I still have to hit with location. I still have to challenge myself and seeing them achieve it a lot. Uh, I think it definitely allowed us to be a, a tougher serving team when it came to matches. I got a so it was really, it was really fun. From the, from the U15 days and down an aviator in Brooklyn where we had this, as soon as I heard that her high school coach told her that she would never be a jump server. As soon as I heard that, I was like, we're going for this guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so yeah, she was a uh, 14 and I had them jump serving every day. She was a defensive specialist and uh, I put her in specifically, I rotated her in, subbed her in to jump serve against his team. And she ended up rattling off six points on jump serves. And nice. I was just like, wanted to rub it in any, you can't coach's face just to say like, you just didn't know how to coach, you know, mm-hmm. you just got to challenge her. And she was nervous. But after that first ace, oh man, she was like staring him down. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, brought that Gooder, Gooder, who uh, kicked their butts in college, definitely kicked my butt, except for one year. We had to go uh-huh. Um, he's hanging out in between, oh. uh, in between his uh, little endeavors in Texas over there. He's a really, really smart financial guy. Um, but anyway, not so related, but how, or how about food the night before, during the day, or before matches? And for anybody out there who's looking for food advice, we do have a 100% nutrition plan uh, with the 60 day night critical program, but as a quick hitter, increase your carbohydrate intake for one to two days before your event. And of course you want to get enough protein so that you're feeding your muscles, but you have to have a store of complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are things like pasta and bread. You can't base your entire diet around these because they're kind of low nutrient. You won't get a ton of vitamins out of them, but you will get a lot of energy out of them. When we say carbohydrates, we don't mean sugar. We don't mean my favorite Sour Patch Kids because your body will go through Dang it. that sugar quickly. <laughs> Throughout the day, uh, you your breakfast the morning of, you got to pile in carbs. You have to have more toast and more fruit than eggs and bacon. So you got to get those carbohydrates in there. And then throughout the day, yeah, trail mix is fantastic. Roots are fantastic. Roots are a quick source of sugar, which means your body can kind of run through them and get quick hits of energy. So we tell all of our campers and people who come to our clinics, you guys have to bring lots of fruit for your full day of match or a full day of training. And you should be eating every half hour if you're planning on playing all day like that just means a bite it means half a bottle of of gatorade if that's what you're kind of resorting to we don't love gatorade but it does provide some sugar some carbohydrates for energy so uh the the best thing that we can tell you guys is first of all know what reacts well with your body which means that try different diets don't try one diet go for a bunch of them and measure what happens? See how you feel the next day. Write it down. Go for one diet for three or four days in a row and say, does my body feel good, better, or the same? For me, it's not for everybody, but for me, I know that when I increase dairy, then my body feels just goes way down. I feel heavier. I feel slower. It doesn't react well with my stomach, but I do love cheese. So I'll save those cheesy days for days when I don't have to perform the next day. Um, but you have to know what your body reacts well to, and you have to have a steady supply of carbohydrates, big carb loading before tournament days, and then morning of, you want a lot like toast fruit, and then throughout the day, trail mix fruit is going to be uh, a good friend for you. 
Uh, Marco Molina, he said, we have two different locations coming in New York. So our clinics are going to be in Westchester, New York. That's on the betteratbeach.com forward slash clinics page. And we're going to be in endless summer. Endless summer is going to be a tiny clinic. We only have 24 spots. Uh, we had one court last time and it sold out. So we opened it up to two courts and that's the maximum they have. We're also working on seeing if we can get over to Highline in New Jersey. But uh, you can sign up for those right now, betterbeach.com forward slash clinics. And Gooder loves your one-footed floating. I can't hear you. Um, I love a good one-footed floaty. Um, and I I think it it's... I think it's easier to concentrate on the, the trajectory of the ball too. So like I started playing around with a one foot float serve, like jumping off one foot. Um, and it, it allowed me to get the ball to travel closer to the net more consistently than a two, a normal, like two hop uh, float serve. But yes, I agree. I think it's easier for me to find the location. It's easier for me to find the spin and you use that momentum a lot. Uh, from that kind of run up to the court, which kind of carries to the ball. And then moving into the next comment, the line to line float serve all day. Um, Eric's my man, he's from Salt Lake. He, uh, he lived by that advice and he just saw yeah. like results and results and results. Yeah. And we, we didn't really talk about starting location as far as velocity, but if, if, uh, if you're thinking about the dimensions of the court, Obviously, serving line to line, or if you're in the middle of the court, serving straight down the seam, then that is the quickest amount of time that the ball is going to get to that location. So any type of line to line serve or straight serve, uh, doesn't matter what line you're on, or if you're standing in the middle of the court serving the seam, but those serves are going to be very effective because it's going to get to that target location as about as quick as possible. Yeah, which is like a simulating of speed, right? It's, you're yeah. increasing the reaction time. So you can either serve harder or you can uh, choose a shorter line. That's mm -hmm. a smart point. Yeah. So I okay. like it. Uh, yeah, that's all we got. a lot of passive practice today. Just so you know. I like it. That's what I want. It's going to be fun. Your knees ready and then we're, short And then we're getting back. Oh, yeah. My, uh, my hips are good. Dr. Palmer got me all hooked up. So I'm feeling nice, um, ready to get going. Cool. All right. All right. I'll see you down there. See you on the sand.